out also, or at least I might. So. Okay. All right. Well, uh, now we're now we're on board over here. Um, I think this is, a, yeah, this is about the oh. stream. Yes. Oh, there's Ira. Yeah. Um, park. <laughs> sorry. I said you're not at the park. I'm not at the park. No. Uh, that's uh, yeah. That's that is not the park. Uh, okay. So um, welcome to Parsha Shavua. Uh, we we've started since Bereshit and we're not stopping. Um, and uh, so now we're on Chai Sara, yep. uh, which is a relative, which is to my delight, a relatively short and businesslike uh, parsha, which um, uh, starts from the death of Sarah and the and finding the burial plot and negotiating for the burial plot, and then going on to appoint Eliezer of Damascus to find Rebecca using a series of very pointed questions. Um, and then, yes, and then we basically end up and at then, the uh, end of the Parsha with uh, Abraham uh, growing growing old. And um, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much Chai Sarah. I mean, what else? What else what well, else? Well, actually, actually, sort of like the peculiar, the peculiar thing in Chaye Sara. At the end, is that is that we have and and Abraham marries Keturah. Oh, right, Keturah. Who some people who be Hagar, who some people take to take to be Hagar, and then we get and then we get the list of Keturah's children, and then at the very end we we get the uh, the genealogy of Ishmael. Um, so I don't know to explain how those interact with, uh, with the, with the life of Sarah, that's a, uh, we can, we can try to, we can try to offer some kind of, some kind of solution to that. Um, but the, there are a couple, there are a couple things, uh, that we were talking about and, uh, I think that we can kind of we can kind of see if they join up at all. Um, but there's the idea of of this of the parsha being you know it's Chaye Sarah, so the theme should be the life of Sarah. So right. and it's, it's so clear. Kind of, right. uh, <laughs> yes, well, but it raises the question of like what is the life of Sarah, and like and like how do we know what the life of Sarah is and, and, you know, what is it to her? Um, you know, we, we totally, we totally don't, we totally don't have that because at the end of the Parsha, it says that, uh, uh, where it says that, uh, Abraham dies, it says, uh, he breathed his last dying at a good ripe age, old and contented. Um, which is, uh, you know, if you compare him to, to, uh, Jacob, Jacob is like, you know, he's old, grumpy, irritated, and feels like he's wasted, wasted his life. Um, so, you know, I mean, you can argue about his achievements mm -hmm. in life, but, but, you know, you would argue. You would definitely argue. Well, let me ask, let me ask you this: like, there's is there? Do you think there's a correlation to happiness and um, old age in the in in the way the Torah works? That like people die progressively younger and are seemingly less happy as time goes on. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, the people the people who the people who die. In the parsha, that uh, Abraham is 175 and Sarah is 127, and Ishmael is 137. Um, but we don't really like. But Sarah dies off stage, and like we can go back and talk about that, and and. Ishmael dies off stage. Like, like we don't. Um, I'm not sure what it says. Let's see what it says. 
what it says about him. Um, I mean, it's completely, it's just, he breathed his last and died. <laughs> <laughs> like that's very that's very not like no information is being provided of any kind um you know it's like yes he is not he is dead i i he's dead um so i'm not so i'm not sure if i can answer the question um <laughs> but you know if you look at sort of what happened with ishmael and hagar early on I mean, he seems like a basically happy kid. And then, and then, you know, stuff goes down, which is not that great for him for a while. And then things are taken care of. And he basically, like, we, you know, we never hear of, re of any really big problems that he has in his life after that. So, Actually, it just, you know, something that just popped into my head was, um, when's the first time we see even the concept of inheritance? Um, like the fairish, like explicitly. I mean, like, I, I guess you can kind of say that it showed up in the Garden of Eden, sort of, but like the actual primogeniture, the actual passing on possessions, because it didn't seem like Cain and Abel were fighting for that and it didn't seem like Noah's children were fighting over anything in particular well I mean the problem the problem with that with that particular issue is that I, I, I like did the math for how long everybody lives in the in the period before the flood and Almost everybody is still alive. Oh, right. So you can't actually have a narrative. Yeah, there, there's like, they're like, no, well, I mean, you could theoretically, it's sort of like it wouldn't have been a big discussion because it wouldn't happen very often. Um, and, and the other, and the characterization of that generation is that they steal, that they steal from each other all the time. So it's like, if you're just going to steal whatever you want, why do you worry about inheritance? Um, uh, so inher inheritance really only makes sense after you start having wars, which seem to uh, stem from the idea of property rights and organization. Yeah, well, what, so is, you can what, is, what is it? Uh, uh, like war, war is... Uh, uh, you know, law by other means. Right. Um, well, no, but it's like, but it's like, you know, you don't, you don't like inherit somebody while you're still alive. So like, so like you could, I mean, the, the, the whole, the thing about Noah is that he seems to like, like one of the things that makes him righteous is that he actually keeps his family together. All right. All right. That like, that they're, that they're motivated to stay together. They don't, you know, they don't need to, they're not going to take their own. Um, and that's like nobody else, nobody else in that period, even, even Adam and Chava are not really, are not really sort of just like, they don't, Cain don't have an and, extracurricular like commitment to each other or anything like well, that. Well, Cain and Abel don't come home for don't come home for dinner with them every night. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I was just looking at the micro kadolot about the Machpela, and it never occurred to me that Machpela is a weird name for a cave. And I think it was Rashbam who makes the point that Machpela has to do with the fact that people that that um that there's a, a couple that they're going to be buried together eventually. Oh, uh, oh, ca oh, capellet, like ca from kaful, like uh, like the double. Oh, kaful, kaful. Yes, that's the that's the word for doubling. Yeah. Um, so I was like, oh, yeah. I guess that's that's pretty clever. When you say inheritance, sorry, I mean, what were you father, saying? The fatherly blessing is is a form of inheritance, right? Or um, 
Or do you mean really just property inheritance? Oh, yeah. Um, I, mean, I think it's a signifier of inheritance. And what's interesting is that well, actually kafula could also mean that because that's literally the double portion. Um, although there's a specific word for that. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's interesting because we use that. It is it is sort of like a well, see, for for Ephraim and Menasha, it's like a property thing. But uh, for Rivka, Rachel, uh, and Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, um, it does seem to have more of a, uh, it, leans, it leans towards the way we use both of them now as, as like spiritual inheritance. Um, although you could, you know, you could say that a, you could say that uh, uh, those are that's also designation by tribe, um, but it's interesting then that you would split it. Yeah, it's right. It's because <laughs> um, the because the those first blessings at the beginning are attached to the rest, aren't they? Wait, which blessings? Uh, well, it's like Yivarechecha Adonai Kefrayim uh, Menasha. Yeah, yeah. Yivarechecha Adonai Keserecha Rachel Valeya. And then, and then you have the priestly blessing. Proper. Yeah, yeah. So, like those two elements. Ah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, they do sort of work together. Mind when we use them. Um. So. And actually, that's an interest, but there's an interesting point to the Ephraim and Menashe bit, which is that each of them inherit their own share, despite being one further down in the line. So it's like they're, they're they have a, a reward of the, but in a way, it makes Joseph have the double portion, even though he's not the oldest, not the eldest. It could be because of his relationship to um, to uh, Rachel, but. Uh, it, it wouldn't make any sense. I I, I think like, um, yeah, they're, 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 I think the fact that Ephraim and Menashe are listed separately as getting a portion equivalent to all the other uncles um, is kind of like a way to tie it all together. I don't know what are talking about? Yeah. So anyway, let's go. Let's go back to Chayes. Sorry. All right. 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 <laughs> I want to. I want to go to. Uh, we're, easily, to we're easily distracted, Ira. <laughs> I. I don't know. It's a shiny object. There are a lot of shiny objects. Uh, one shiny object I, I want to talk about is the end of the parsha with Ketoret and Hagar somehow coming back in theoretically it's coming back. Ketura. Ketura. <laughs> no, I, Ketoret is because the, the the Rashi commentary says she's called Ketura because. Her deeds are good, and it's like Ketoret, and so on. So, like, slip up, but that's, that's the idea. Um, what's going on there? Um, well, you know, there is... Is she, is she a different person? Star is, is, kind of, is kind of the question. Um, and, you know, you, you have to, like, like, would Abraham, there, there's kind of, there's kind of a sense that if, if she's Hagar, Abraham would have, would have had to seek her out. Yeah. You know, would have had to say, it's, yeah. it's okay. You should come, you should come back. Um, and it does, it sort of speaks well of him. It's a kind of loyalty. Um, so. Because he was kind of reluctant that she, to get rid of in the first place. That was his idea, at least. Although it kind of um, looks like the way they, they pass off blame to the woman in, uh, in the Garden of Eden in a way. It's like, oh, she has a bright idea. Well, well, it's unclear whether he's reluctant to, I mean, he, 
he doesn't want to kick Hagar out because he doesn't want to kick somebody out. Or he doesn't want he to lose the just chance like, to his like, chance to get a son. Well, that's why he doesn't that's why he doesn't want to get rid of Yishmael. Yeah. Um, but but he's but he's also he the reluctance that he has to get to, to let Hagar go is is not as clearly, you know, based on a close relationship. It's just like he really likes the boy. He really, really likes the boy. Um, so, so if we, if if Keturah is Hagar, then then you can read back and you can say yes, he like he actually did actually did love Hagar. He actually was actually was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, someone, someone who was, who was like, it was a good relationship. It was, it was a relationship that it was what we would, what we would call nowadays a healthy relationship. Right. Um, and I mean, that goes, that, the, the whole story of Hagar goes to, goes to kind of thing that I, that I was interested in is with, with the, sort of how Abraham is perceived and and what sort of like sort of like Abraham is not by himself uh, that the perception of Abraham is not the perception of of just an individual on on his own but he's perceived as 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 part of a group and part of uh, a history. Um, you, yeah, I, I, was it Rashbaum that you that you that you found who who basically who basically uh, talked about that? Was he the commentator? Well, I mean, it, it's from Rashi on down for the for about Ketura. Um and uh, yeah, there's some really interesting. Uh, I was I was thinking about the, I was thinking about the comment uh, related to uh, related to the Hittites. Um, there's a there's a there's a phrase in the negotiation negotiations that Abraham uh, is having with the Hittites, and they and they say to him, "You are you are Nasi Elohim." Oh right right right. Um, so like so like they're like if he's Nasi Elohim, that's like specifically implying that implying that like there are things that are known about this guy. Yeah, so so that that's that it goes back and forth over whether um, one one uh, one commentator says he's called Nasi Elohim because um, yeah he's a prophet. I think that was a rush bomb, right? And then even Ezra was saying I don't know, I think he's, just, that's he's okay. just not he's just not he's not a he's not a a Gerva Toshav. He's not like a temporary resident. He's a real resident. So he's like part of the family, and he doesn't have to pay anything. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so like if you think about that, it's like he's a resident. So like, what's the like? What do they think about you know the deal with him and Hagar and Ishmael? Like, is that is that part of the body of knowledge that they have about Abraham? Is that you know he's like. He's like very determined to have to have his uh, his line work out in a certain way. You know, is that is that a piece of their knowledge of him? Is that a part of his what it means for him to be a prophet? That like that like he he he, he can see in his he can see the future through his family. Uh, well, so, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that how it, because it's like you know part of what. Uh, what I assume Abraham's real demonstration of prophecy was, was when he was down with Abimelech and could tell why children were coming and why they weren't, which he had a lot of experience in knowing that there's a, a lot of divine intervention over whether children are coming or are not. So uh, it seems that the most critical aspect of, of prophecy that came over and over again, it had all to do with, um, with children and uh, also inheritance. I mean, that was basically 
other subject matters for prophecy. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this <laughs> that kind of, that kind of goes back to this idea, this idea that we were discussing about, you know, this parsha, you know, the essence of what goes on in this parsha is is uh, death, weddings, and children. Yeah, which, right. are all... which I think it's important to get to the get to the the, the midsection of this part shows the most exciting part where Eliezer of Dama Dama Damascus is forced to testify as as we talk about in, in class. Uh, <laughs> although although what's interesting is that um, that whole thing is interpreted by the commentaries as like he has to get a Britney love. Um, so. It's interesting because for Eliezer of Damascus, like the idea is like he's making a loyal, a very deep, like sort of loyalty oath to Abraham. Uh, but the commentators choose not to see it that way before he goes out to find Rebecca and actually sees it as like, you no, know, Eliezer of Damascus, his loyalty oath isn't to Abraham, it's actually to the Jewish people or the people that come from Abraham, which is the difference between a Brit Milah and a personal loyalty oath to Abraham. Uh, well, but Eliezer, Eliezer, uh, I mean, what's, what's great about, what's great about him is like, is like Abraham, Abraham sends him out as his agent. So, you know, this is like in Judaism, it's like agency is a big, is a big concept. Um, so he sends him as, as his agent and, and when he shows up, like as, as an agent, he like, makes a negotiation with God. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is like, you know, it, it's it's just like a you know like you wonder like like you wonder God is God is God is like you know God gets this God gets this communication from from Eliezer and and you know what's the response? It's like it's like I haven't talked to this guy before. I'm not sure. This seems this seems kind of uh, like out of out of left field. But uh, right, right. let's let's invest. You know, let's investigate this and, and see and see if this and see if this uh, see if this is something that we need to deal with. Oh yes. Okay. Well. Well. You know, since he's since he's the the shaliach of of Abraham, I guess I you know I guess this is uh, this is as good as Abraham. So I should definitely deal with this right away. Um, uh, but you know, like it's it's very chutzpahdik. It's very chutzpahdik. You know, he's he like, uh, you know, he Abraham Abraham places him as his as his messenger, and he just like he's totally invested. I mean, this is this is why this is why I like Eliezer so much because mm -hmm. he's, just, he's just like completely in it. Um, and you know what like 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 there doesn't there's there's nothing there's nothing explicit that you could that you could sort of name other than personal loyalty that that motivates him like that you, you know what <laughs> you know what's wild about this whole thing though i was just i was just looking up the quote where god starts talking which is on uh, verse 12 and I'm seeing like the the shalshelet trope is there when it's of said Vayomer Hashem, like and the shalshelet trope is like the last time we see it is with Lot as he hesitates over whether to leave uh, Sodom or not. And so the way it kind of reads here is God is like, uh, do I speak to this guy? <laughs> uh, yes, that's a see that's a. I can't, I can't, I can't comment on the Torah based on the trope. That's, I'll leave that. I'll well, leave that's that. just the one specific, I mean, the Shalsha trope is just like, the Shalsha trope is just so, it's so it's unique. Really uncommon. Yeah. It's extremely uncommon. So like, I can't really make a comment about most trope, but you can make a comment on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I just... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can make it there. You can sort of make the argument that like God is that God is pushed along by by Eliezer's enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, 
you know, it's it's like it's like I I did I didn't know and and he's such a like he seems to really understand the dynamics of situations in a way that in a way that's like a bit more um, and he you know he he does a he does a really good job um and everything really comes together until the end where they keep trying to like keep they keep on trying to keep rebecca for longer um yeah oh yeah they try to hold on to her for a little while yeah well like long longer and longer and he finally it it's like it's like he's new the whole time he's negotiating and and finally at that at that point he has to like use authority uh in order in order to move things along so it's like so like he loses he loses his complete finesse at that point um but uh but laban has that ability he shows up over and over again as being a um a living wrench He's kind of he's an annoying person. He's just an, <laughs> he's just an annoying person. Um, is what it is is like is that is this the story where he like goes to goes to like there's the one story where someone goes and kisses somebody else and and uh, and there and you know you can read this as like this is this is very friendly. And then one of the commentators says, it's like, he wants to see if he has money in his mouth or something like that. Um, that could be the story of Asaph meeting Jacob out in the field or, Oh no, it could be. No, this is Levon. No, you're absolutely right. This is Levon. He goes and kisses. Eli yeah, that's right. He goes and kisses Eliezer and immediately that's what they're like. I thought uh, I always I always thought, like, man, you really don't like this guy. It's like, it's like well, you really, you know, really don't like to say you, anything nice about. Him. I think one of the undervalued uh, or underestimated parts of rabbinic commentary on Torah is that each villain gets their own like weakness or like desire, and they're all different from each other. So I, I got this idea from the Maharal, who's just working backwards. Um, he said that like Rome just seeks destruction and Babylon just wanted to like, like to power and Persia just wanted wealth. Um, and they work this backwards into saying like Aesop really wanted to just kill. And they work it backwards into saying Lavan really just wanted to steal or to take. Um, and, um, and, and, and you can see that like, you know, I, I think people talk about uh, the oversimplification of the good characters as all good um, as like an annoying feature of rabbinic commentary. But I, I, then you end up losing the, the really sort of interesting moral philosophy that emerges when you decide that each bad character is unilaterally bad, but in different ways that, that show up as human characteristics that flow through the world. Yeah, I mean, that... That bothers me more with some of the characters than with others. It particularly bothers me with the uh, with Esau, who, who if you look at what's actually in Torah, he's not a bad guy. He's, yeah, that one's a weird one. He's literally, he's literally just not a bad guy. Um, you know, uh, Abraham is a Abra. You know, or excuse me, yeah. Esau. Uh, Esau goes with. I'm having like my brain is going away. I know uh, my, my face feels like it's melted, but um, it's still a good time. Uh, well, like uh, Jacob and Esau. So when Jacob comes, so when Jacob comes to meet him, Jacob is like Jacob has imagined this like this monster um, and Esau just disappoints him in every way. He's, he's like, you know, and, and, you know, Esau says, let's, let's go together 
well, you know, let's go down the road together and, and, and spend time together. And Jacob, Jacob is immediately like, Oh no, I got to get out of here. Um, like, like even when it, it's like, he never stops. He never stops thinking, Oh, Oh, this guy is about to do something to me. He like, he cannot, he, he can't accept uh, that Esau is not a bad guy. So that, so that could be like a model for the rabbi's inability to accept that Esau is not a bad guy. Um, yeah. And then they, you know, and then they just like tag, tag actual, actual people who are, uh, who are not specifically Esau as Esau and, and like, see, they've always, they've always had it in for us. Uh, right. Right. That you know, that's like that that that's the one that really that really bothers me uh, the most. Um, there, uh, there are the two advisors, Achi Tofel, and I can I can't remember the other guy, um, who the who in the Talmud are are often put up as like as like really really evil evil characters. And uh, people, well, there's specifically example of people who gave up their share in the world to come uh, yeah. uh, through through their through their evilness, and it's and it's just like there are so many people in Tanakh. Are these guys really the worst? Um, <laughs> like, you know, couldn't you couldn't you spread it around? Couldn't you like sometimes mention that? some other people were bad why always like you know why are you always putting the knock on these two guys um and you know it's it's like and when i and when i read and when i read about them in the in the um in kings uh i feel like they're not like it's not that bad. Achi Tofel commits suicide, mm -hmm. um, and and I guess he's part of a rebellion against against David. That's uh, coming back. Uh, but he's like a really good advisor. Like if you ask him for advice, he gives you really good advice. Like if you like if you take his advice, it'll work out. Yeah. And and the the reason why he commits suicide is because he gives good advice and 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 his advice is ignored and it's bad for the person who doesn't listen to him, which is then bad, which is then bad for him. Um, and I'm just like, this seems this seems like not so like intensely obvious that like this is this should be your object lesson for all time. Um, right. I don't. I you know this is like this is like the 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 problem of making of making a, a character into a trope. Um, I mean, and this is this is sort of why I'm this is sort of why I'm always thinking about uh, other lenses for the characters. Um, you know, I I brought up the idea a few weeks ago of of the question of whether or not the the breed is specifically with Sarah as well as Abraham. Oh right. Um, and you know this there are there are ways that you can there are ways that this idea is challenged um in sort of like the gendered basis of of things and and the sort of like well if it's not on the page then then you can't even comment on it. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're married to the president, you know, you're the, you're the first lady, you're, you have like, you have like an implication in what's, yes. in what's being, in what's being done. This is like, this is like the sort of like all the, all the liberal all the liberal people who hate Donald Trump who are like, you know, when are you going to stand up for us, Melania? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
you know, it's, it's like, it's like, how can Melania put up with this? Um, you know, so, so like, so like there's, you know, there's, there's this identification. So, so like, even, even if not, but I mean, to go to, to go into the, um, if the, you know, the breed is this physical, is this physical manifestation, breed Mila is a physical manis, manifestation of the covenant. Um, but, but the person, but the person who bears the sign of the breed in their body is the person who had an effect on the body uh, of the person of the person who bore them. So like, so like there, so like the uh, Brit Milas is almost like a secondary, a secondary body um, mm. from you know, to, to mark the covenant. Um, you know, the covenant is, uh, is, is actually, is actually the, the whole the whole sort of argument about Ishmael or Ishmael or Isaac is uh, is you know it's like well the covenant is not you know the covenant with Abraham is not fulfilled to to uh, to Abraham through Hagar and Ishmael. And, and so, so like, then you would say, well, Sarah is a party to a specific aspect of the covenant with Abraham. But then, but then when, see, like God actually makes a covenant with Hagar, not with, not with Abraham. There's like, ah, you're right. Yeah. There's, you know, the, that or, or it's sort of it's sort of, you know it's like you know you it could have you might have you might have thought that through you the covenant the covenant with Abraham is fulfilled but but something else was intended but your child is also a child of Abraham so I am going to I am going to establish uh, sort of like an additional clause to the covenant with yeah, you, that's, 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 but it's that's, not negotiated with with Abraham. No, that's an interesting point. I think that um, if you come to see Brit Mila and the specific uh, contract uh, agreements with the patriarchs as really one side of the whole equation, because you can have like similar um, markings amongst women and and deals with God amongst women. Um, then it, it, um, it, it kind of, it kind it, it's kind of solves a certain mystery about what exactly Brit Mila is going to, to demonstrate to anybody. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also, it's also really interesting to go back to Keturah, um, like Keturah, it, it says that she, that, that Abraham doesn't, uh, doesn't, inherit any of her sons that that she has when they when they're together after Sarah dies and that that uh but that he gives them gifts in his lifetime and in a way it's like well well you know you wouldn't inherit them in the way you would inherit a firstborn son because because he already has inherited her firstborn son um you know like like he's he is going like he's already gotten an inheritance that he's that he's going to be the father of of 12 nations so it's like so it's like like abraham can't give an inheritance to the other ones because he's already given away given it away so then so then you would say well well okay that's it so so Ketura has to be hagar um because it because like then, because then it all fits. Like all the all the pieces of the puzzle come together. Um, if you if you assume if you assume that, um, 
And I mean, I guess, I guess part of like, part of the, the idea within like inheritance, I mean, you're, you're right to bring it up. Like when is the first time we really see inheritance and yeah. it's definitely, it's, you know, it's like with the, with the genealogy of, um, of Noah, there's like then nations of the world are sort of indicated out of that, yeah. Um, yeah. which with Noah, it's just kind of an etiology because there's oh. nobody else. Well, I mean, I you know, it's kind like, of a, like oh, we, the thing about inheritance oh, is that oh. when you really think about it, it's a really zero sum game of either you're on top of the social pile or you're a, a meaningless, nameless slave. Uh, like you kind of, you inherit, I guess it's important to say that um, that inheritance is not just, a, in, in those days, it's not a matter of, of a convenience, but of like even the, the ability to preserve your identity at all. Uh, um, Hagar and, or Keturah and, um, and Yishmael do get to preserve their identity. So on, on that front, they kind of do it inherit, but they don't inherit like what's most precious and prized of, of Abraham. They do inherit enough to sort of um, create their own nations. And, and Hagar is later on described as actually Batparo herself. I don't know how that, that happens, but uh, who rescues Moses. Um, so, so there, there's this like continuous, the, 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 the real battle of over identity and not is, um, is not just like a, a, a factor of convenience. It's a factor of like existence. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the idea of the idea among farming people, uh, of of having like a a primary inheritor is that you don't split up the land and the labor force so much that you end up not being able to produce for everybody. Um, there's like there's just sort of like a sense that a sense that you need to that you need to have like enough organization to 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 keep the agricultural prod project going. Um, I don't know. It's a, you know, the first, the first son is the biggest scrapper is like another, another idea, which is less, uh, less exciting and pleasant. Um, but you know, the, I, the other, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the stories of, of David, David and Solomon, it's like, you know, have an order of inheritance just so that everybody doesn't fight. Right. right. Like that, that, you know, you can, that like the, the death of one person is not the end of the social order, um, which, you know, which doesn't work at all with David and Solomon, but, uh, but, you know, it's the, uh, it's the idea uh, behind it, um, you know, in a, in a healthier, in a healthier social order. Um, that's a, what happens, what happens with David and Solomon is, is like considered their, the significant part of how they are, they are, uh, seen to be, uh, not perfect objects is in the way they fail to, in the way they fail to handle those things while they're still alive. It's yeah, like they manage, it. they manage to screw up the, yeah. the while they're still alive, um, which is, which is pretty bad. Um, but I mean, to go, you asked, you asked the question, you asked the question about, you know, whether Ishmael is happy or not. Like whether Ishmael is contented, and 
if you look at the, you know, Ishmael and Ishmael and, and Isaac get together to bury Abraham. And so like they're like they're able they're able to do that. And like it, there isn't an explanation that says that they reconcile with each other. Um, but they're able to be with each other. Um, but there is also like they don't we don't see them talking at all, which gives us a sense that like this is a distant relationship that like that like you know they're there's the talk about they they're playing together as kids, which the rabbi used to the rabbis used to like speak badly of Ishmael, which I don't really, which I think is, is it's kind of a, kind of a, a, a nasty implication. Yeah. Um, and there, and there's nothing, there's nothing that comes after it about Ishmael ever that like, that goes with that. Um, so it, is the so it's like, which is a bit weird. Um, what do you mean? Like the whole wild, I think he's described as wild or something like that. Yeah, well, but you know, uh, uh, kids are, kids are wild. True. <laughs> you know, it's like, he's a teenager, he's a teenager playing with a little boy and like, you know how great is how great is his judgment? You know he's like in a, like when they're talking about it, he's like an eleven or twelve year old kid, That's something true. something like that. Um, and you know it's like some people are some people are just rougher rougher people. Um, it didn't seem to bother Abraham. Like I like you right, know, and I think I think uh, I mean it seems like Isaac uh, had a soft spot for that because of his soft spot for Asaph. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, like like it, you know, he has he has the rough the rough and the the rough and the delicate child, and he likes the rough child. I mean, it, it, you himself. could like be able to pin Isaac's uh, preference for Asaph based on like a hidden sort of preference for Ishmael that we don't really understand. Yeah, uh, or you know, just like it's like he might not even even have been like totally conscious of it, because he you know he might not like Esau as an adult, but it's like but it's like the memory of the dynamic that he had with the kid Esau might be a pleasant a pleasant dynamic for him, so that when he has so that when when he has that kid in front of him, yeah, he enjoys that yeah. kid. Right. That makes uh, sense. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, that, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a, it's. A, um, you'll you'll have to see if you can find that in the commentators. Probably not. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> nothing. Think nothing so. nice about Esau. No, no, that would. It, it, yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to get on the page to. We're gonna have to get a, on the micro get a load page, uh, eventually. Uh, I mean, I'm generally, to, I'm generally to, uh, on, on micro Godolobes like for the parsha, but of course, like, you know, I think, I think in the in the coming weeks, um, you know, obviously, like, still everything's a little in in quit. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Inch. Um, Everything's still in formation, so that's why. Um, so a, as time goes on, what we're going to start doing is really getting on the micro Godola page. We're going to be able to display that to people. We're going to stick to it, um, and these free roaming discussions will be slightly less so and more um, easily followable. Um, and I think it'll. I think it'll be really good. I think. I think as time goes on. Um, uh, we're we're just going to get more practiced at, um, at at the message we want to send here, which is a very I think I think uh, a very human focused one um, that 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 you that you believe yeah, in. I mean, for, 
for for me, I you know like you know we're not pursuing we're not pursuing an academic we're not pursuing an academic study of it. So like we don't have to we don't have to take we don't have to take a specific you know a specific verse and and uh, you know work all of work all of the commentators uh, work all of the classic commentators all the way through that's not really um because sometimes their because sometimes their comments are uh like then i would have to then i would have to like uh uh get into why i don't like what well it's just saying it's just each I, each commentary each commentary and each way of doing things is this it's its own parallel universe and um we still it's good to be able to track where we are in the parallel universes, which there are many, Midrash included, Halakha included, the whole thing. Um, but um, but yeah, we'll have our own. We'll have our own one to go along with it all. And um, I think that I, and that's what we've been doing, and I think we're just going to be able to enhance this as we go along. Um, that's with you know. Where you are in the Tanah? Um, am I? Am I still? Am I still? Uh, no, you're here now. You're here. You're, you're here. Now. Um, you know, in Bray Sheet, in Bray Sheet, there's there's just really a lot of of uh, very sort of imaginable personal interactions, uh, um, and so. And so the idea that we're spending in Brashid a lot of time trying to understand, understand who people are and and what motivates them and what their you know what the nature of their relationships are is really is really like it's strongest in how we need to look at Brashid uh, of all of the of all of the Hamisha Humshe Torah. Um, you know, when we get into, when we get into, you know, Shmot and beyond, there, there are different concerns, which kind of, which kind of take up a lot more space. Uh, and, and we need to, and at that point, we're, we're actually character of God, like that, like, like, what, like, what is what is motive like we kind of don't have to figure out god completely in bray sheet uh, oh, yeah. but starting but starting in schmode it becomes a much bigger, <clears throat> it becomes a much bigger issue uh you know when the because when you when you start getting into all of the halakha you know the halakha are details of a relationship between between god and man there's sort of there's sort of like uh uh expectations and and sort of like like this is what we need to do to get along um and and that that becomes very different so i don't know i mean i i I, for me me, that's a really big that's a subject no i mean my my personal favorite is is to figure out how to make Leviticus as exciting as possible. So that's good. So hopefully we'll be ramped up by, by then to get that right. Um, but, but I think, but I think for now, I'm going to end it here. Um, uh, and we'll see you hopefully Saturday morning, nine 30 as usual. And, and Sunday will be a very exciting program for all those who don't know about it. Brenda Yvonne Miner is going to be speaking on her journey across the world, learning about how different, spiritual traditions approach matters of justice and how they approach God and, and, and humanity. And, um, and yeah, every, all the details are in your newsletter, which I sent out a little bit ago. Uh, you know, we'll be, we'll get more disciplined as time goes on. That's the big promise and, and uh, more and better to come. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I may, I may, I may uh, have less value on discipline than Zach. Um, discipline has its place. <laughs> I don't. I don't exactly know where it is, but people keep telling me about it. Yes. 
So anyway, thank you, thank you for joining us, Ira, and the people on and the people on Facebook uh, Live, um, and whoever sees this down the line, uh, okay. thanks for uh, if you. If you if you came if you came and saw this uh, you know six six weeks or six months or six years from now, and and you're hearing me say this, thank you for bearing with us. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. All right, and, and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat.